Uh, good morning or good evening, wherever we find you this week for this recording. Uh, we're very glad that you're uh, watching this, and we're just encouraged knowing that uh, regardless of uh, how we're separated right now because of the circumstance that we're in, we're still connected um, because the, the church of God, the family of God cannot be um, taken apart. We're still going to worship together today um, through the, the means of video that we have today, but we're just going to start off this, this service um, just praising God because he's always with us and he's always fighting for us. So let's um, praise him together. My foes are many, they rise against me, but I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way. And oh my God, he will not delay. My refuge and strength always. I will not fear. His promise is true. My God will come through always, abounding my soul will rest in you I will not fear the war I will not fear the storm my help is on the way Let's sing it my help is on the way and oh my God he will not delay my refuge and strength from the Lord I lift my eyes up my help comes from the Lord I lift my eyes up my help comes from the Lord Let's say that one more time I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord. And oh my God, He will not delay my refuge and strength always. I will not fear, His promise is true, my God will come through. Good morning, Cornerstone. He is risen. I heard it. I heard it. I heard it from those pajama-clad people out there. Uh, the, the assignment was easy. The children were supposed to take home a little plastic egg and fill it with something that represented Easter. On the day that the assignment was due, children came into class. One little boy had an egg, and inside he had a jelly bean representing the 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 treats and the fun of Easter. Uh, the little girl had some seeds in hers that represented 
uh, the new life and, and the joy of spring. Little Eric was next. Eric was a special needs child in the class, and he could hardly contain himself. And when his, seat, when his egg was opened, it was empty. And the teacher thought perhaps Eric misunderstood the assignment, and she was searching for something to say. And all the time, Eric is getting more and more excited. And finally, he just burst out, surprise! Surprise is what Easter is about. <coughs> the grave is empty. Christ has risen. Easter is all about surprise. You know, that, that first Easter held a lot of surprises. When the disciples went to the grave and found that it was empty. When, when they uh, found Jesus gathered with him in the room. They were surprised at the Last Supper when Jesus told them that one of them would betray him. They were surprised when he said that his body, his flesh, was bread. And the wine of the Passover was his blood. As we contemplate communion, this Easter. Let us not be surprised by its impact on us to bring us new life, but let us be overjoyed. In the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it and he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant that was shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. Do this as often as you think of me and rejoice. Lord Jesus, as we celebrate your resurrection, we are overjoyed with the potential. We're overjoyed with the promise. We thank you that you have given us a means to remember what you have done and what it means. We rejoice in the fact that you bring new life, that you bring joy, and that each and every morning, if we will be open to it, you will surprise us with a new day. In your name we pray. Amen. Cornerstone Church family, I have missed you so much. Uh, it's good to be with you today uh, via the internet. Um, these are unusual times that we're living in for sure. Uh, we have never seen anything like this in our lifetime. It's most unusual to not be in church on Easter to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we know he lives, uh, he's on his throne, and uh, we can continue to celebrate that until we come together again, and we will be together again. I uh, want to encourage you, uh, there are some things that we need to do while we are separated. Uh, we need to continue to read God's word daily. We need to continue to pray and stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ, keeping our eyes fixed on Him. Uh, and uh, we need to continue to watch Bob, his sermons, and the Wednesday night teaching. We need to continue to do that until we come together again. So there are some things we need to do, but there are also some things we need not do. Uh, I want to encourage you not to worry. Uh, the Lord Jesus told us that we shouldn't do that. Uh, it's unproductive. Uh, it's not good for us. And so do not worry and do not be afraid. Uh, do not be fearful. Yes, we need to be concerned. We need to take precautions. But please don't be afraid and don't be fearful. Don't worry. Uh, we have uh, a number of prayer items today that we need to pray for. And so I'm going to ask you right now, if you would bow your head, 
close your eyes and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's do that, please. Uh, Father God, uh, there are a number of things that we need to pray for today. There are physical things, there are spiritual things, and there are economic things that concern us right now in the middle of this crisis. Uh, Father, I pray for our missions, uh, Elise West, Central India Christian Mission, Italy for Christ, Rwanda Challenge. I pray for these missions that they will continue to be able to function, and I pray that uh, they can continue to meet the needs of the people that they serve. Father, I pray for Camp Pitt in the middle of this uh, time of transition. I pray God wisdom and blessing and guidance for the leaders there. I pray for Craig and Katie Bennett who were spared this week uh, from a major cyclone that hit Vanuatu. I thank you for saving them. I pray for Mountain Mission School and uh, their ministry. And Father, I certainly pray for Cornerstone, our ministry. I pray, God, that you will continue to keep your hand on us and see us through this unusual time. Uh, Father, I pray uh, for some physical needs now. Uh, I pray for the frontline medical people, uh, the people in the hospitals, doctors, nurses, the people in the nursing homes. Please, God, protect them and give them strength. Father, I pray for the victims of co the coronavirus. Uh, I pray for the families that have lost loved ones. This is hard. I lift them up. I lift up people with the virus right now. Please, oh God, heal them. And Father, I pray that you'll bring this virus to an end. I pray that you'll do that quickly. I lift up some people on our prayer list. Lori Rodriguez, Janet Berger, Buddy Hearn, Janice Gibson, Patty Atkins, Joe Rafferty. I pray for their healing, dear God. And Father, I also lift up our friend Rob Meredith. I pray that you'll see he and Amy through this difficult time. Father, before we close, I pray for these people who are in isolation, the people in hospitals that cannot have visitors, and our nursing home people who cannot have contact with their families and friends. God be with these people. I pray, God, you'll help them to hang on and hold on until this is over. And, Father, for each of us, I pray you'll grow our faith. Help us to lean on you. Help us to keep our eyes fixed firmly on you, on Jesus Christ, the author, the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. And, God, we pray most of all, your will be done. Father, we love you. All of our hope, all of our confidence is in you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you, God, for the resurrection. Thank you, God, that the way to you is made open, is made clear by what Jesus Christ done. The work is finished, it is completed, and you are satisfied. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Cornerstone. God bless you. We'll see you soon. I've talked with a, a lot of people within the last couple of weeks, and a lot of people are kind of upset because the Easter celebration this year seems to be ruined. But uh, when I listen to songs such as the one we're about to play right now, it just reminds me that uh, what we celebrate Easter Day is really something that we should celebrate every day, and that's that Jesus is alive and we have new life through him, and the same power that rose him from the grave that day is within us each and every day. And I think that's something to celebrate, and we're going to celebrate that right here, uh, right now playing the song. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. 
when death was arrested and my life began. The ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan art was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you release from my chains i'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore he canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began, let's sing your grace. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your grace. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. And darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made was arrested and my life began. Sing that again. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested.
I am so glad that you have joined us for this three-part series entitled, He Still Got the Whole World in His Hands. And the title of today's message is Certain, which means to be established beyond doubt. Uncertainty is nothing new. We are accustomed to some uncertainty when it comes to politics, the stock market, or our favorite sports team, but we have entered a new season of uncertainty that rivals 9-11 or maybe even the world wars. We've come to a time where our certainty cannot be based on circumstances. Like when has Cornerstone, or for any church for that matter, canceled Easter? Well, we really actually haven't canceled it. We've postponed it. And the first Sunday we come back, we're going to have a big reunion. And then the second Sunday, we're going to have a celebration of the resurrection. We're going to party like it's 1999, even though it's 2020. And so we're going to have a great time. Now, every believer, even unbelievers, would all agree that times are uncertain in these present days. But hear me, he still got the whole world in his hands. I want you to turn to someone you're sitting with right now at home, or if you're sitting alone, say it to yourself. Say this like you mean it. He still got the whole world in his hands. I want you to say it one more time. He still got the whole world in his hands. One of the most uncertain moments in all history happened in what we call the upper room, the night of Jesus' betrayal, the night of the Passover celebration where Jesus institutes what we now call communion. Jesus and his men had all gathered for this Passover meal, which was the annual meal that celebrated uh, the commemoration of the Exodus moment, where uh, all the Jews that were Israel that was held in captivity after 400 years was, was made the Exodus, that after 400 years of God seeming faithless, he was faithful. After 400 years of unanswered prayer, there was a huge answer to prayer. After 400 years of slavery and harsh treatment, there God raised up a deliverer. His name was Moses, and he led his people out of bondage. Moses stood up to the most powerful man on earth, Pharaoh, and God delivered them against that man's will and they became the nation of Israel that brought forth the Messiah. I'm telling you, we need to understand that God still has the whole world in his hands. Now, 1,400 years after that Exodus moment, we come to this upper room celebration, this upper room Passover moment, where Jesus is gathered with his disciples to commemorate that event. And the disciples are a bit distracted. That's an understatement, that they're a bit distracted. Things are not going well. Their popularity as, a, as an entourage following Jesus has greatly diminished. They were puzzled that day because Jesus did not enter Jerusalem during the day. He comes under the secrecy and cover of night. And there's all this mystery surrounded about this moment, about where they're going to have the Passover celebration. And, and the disciples knew that there was a movement afoot to have Jesus arrested, to have him tried and convicted of crimes that he didn't commit. And Judas, well, that man, he was acting very strangely. It was a night of epic uncertainty. The certainty that the followers of Jesus had grown accustomed to had vanished. Had vanished in just a few days. Now there was more questions than answers. The disciples had done Passover, but not a Passover like this one. This Passover was very different. Last year, thousands of people thronged around Jesus, around his teaching, around the miracles. He was vaulted into celebrity status in Palestine. But now the momentum had turned. There were rumors that there was a group of people trying to arrest and, uh, him and get him alone and, 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 and put these charges against him. The disciples knew that if Jesus went down, they all went down. And so we call it the Last Supper because... It was the last time that Jesus would celebrate the Passover with them on earth. Certainty had vanished. Then Jesus said these unsettling words 
at that supper moment, he says, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Then he began, they began to be sorrow, sorrowful, and he said, uh, and, and to say to him one, one after the other, is it I, is it I? And he said to them, it is the one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. And now they, the disciples, they already knew the answer to what Jesus was saying. Because in that intimate setting, there is that moment where Jesus and Judas are dipping their bread in the same bowl at the same time, and everyone knew who the betrayer was, that betrayer. And so can you imagine how this is a backstabbing moment for all of them? One of the most intimate settings in that culture was to share in the Passover meal. What an insult in this moment. And a chill must have went down everyone's spine when Jesus said this, For the Son of Man goes as it is written of Him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. In this family of disciples, there is a deceiver, Judas. The certainty once present in this band of brothers has now vanished. And a few days before this, life was up and to the right for all of them. They were the most popular men on the planet, as in their minds. Now there's this epic crash of certainty. Everything has vanished that they once knew. The most helpful thing, you see, that we can do for ourselves in a time such as this is read the Bible. Because it contains stories of people's lives who's, uh, who were upended. They, I mean, they woke up and it was a whole new day they had never expected. I mean, uh, we're reading about stories about people who, who, whose lives are dramatically changed, but God is still in their midst. I'm preaching. Are you listening? Most of the human stories we read in the Bible were written in environments of uncertainty. This book is not filled with feel-good messages of a world uh, that we don't live in. It's not a book of people living in a land free from divorce, free from illness, wrinkle-free stories of prosperity of people who get married on Monday, land a great job on Tuesday, have two kids by Wednesday, and Friday they're debt-free. That's not the stories we read about in the Bible, not at all. The Bible has stories like this one about a frightened mother named Jehokabed who wrapped her baby boy in a blanket and then put him in a basket and floated him down the Nile River so he would not be killed by Egyptian soldiers. It's about a teenager named Joseph who from the bottom of a pit listened above to his brothers who were debating whether to kill him or sell him into slavery. It's about a king named David who woke up one morning to find out that his son Absalom was going to try and kill him and overtake his kingdom. It's about a father named Joseph who was awakened in the middle of the night when an angel told him to leave his home immediately to leave Nazareth right away and head to Egypt because Herod's sword was coming their way. It's about a preacher named Paul who proclaimed the promises of God, but at the end of his life found himself in prison and facing a beheading. The Bible is filled with stories of people facing uncertainty and discovering that God is not absent when their world is shaking, but He is diligently at work accomplishing His will in their world and their lives. And now more than ever, we need to be reading the Bible because these are the stories that are so relevant to our lives today. We are reminded that that God has the whole world in His hands because He created the whole world. God has the whole world in His hands because He sustains the world. And God has the whole world in His hands because He gave His Son to redeem this world. Our story is just filled with, with, with God's presence if we just look for it. Now in this story of the, of the, of the upper room, I want to continue where the disciples are going to be even more shaken and they're going to miss the significance of a few statements of Jesus. He took bread after blessing it. He broke it and he gave it to them and he said, Take this is my body. And he took a cup 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank all of it. And he said to them, This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Have you ever had a moment where you were so unsettled, so upset that you had difficulty eating or drinking? This is how the disciples are feeling in this moment. I remember one time when I was a little guy, I faced down my first full plate of eggplant. I thought, there's no way I'm going to eat this food. This smelled bad, it looked bad, but my mom had made it, and everyone had left the table but two people, myself and my dad, who sat on the other end. And we had a stare-down competition. And then when he threatened to give bodily harm to me if I did not eat what was set in front of me, I very upset, tears coming out of my eyes, snot coming down my nose, I began to eat this eggplant. And I didn't taste it. I didn't want it, but I shoved it down. You know, it's just one of those moments where it was just hard to eat because I was so upset and I was missing what my dad was trying to teach me, and that was to be thankful for whatever you're given to eat. And I I finally got the lesson. You know, I finally figured that out. But we're here in a moment where these disciples are having a hard time just eating a small portion of bread and drink juice because their world has been upended. Everything that they've known for the past three and a half years has changed dramatically. And at the institution of the Lord's Supper, no one ate with joy. No one ate with certainty except Jesus about what the next few days would would hold for them. And so what Jesus is doing is he is illustrating through this uh, celebratory meal we call communion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And, And they would leave that room... And they would miss some other things that he would say because they're so unsettled. Their lives are so upended. As they exit the room, they head up the Mount of Olives, this small mountain just outside of Jerusalem, just a small hill. And as they're walking up there, he says to all of them now, he says, Oh, and by the way, all of you will forsake me tonight. You know, Peter gives that rebuttal. He says, no, not me, Lord. And Jesus turns to him and says, yes, Peter, even you before the cock crows three times, you're going to betray the Son of Man. They were so troubled by hearing this information. They were so unsettled by hearing this information. They completely miss the very next words that he says. But after I am raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Have you ever noticed this before? I mean, this should have been affirming words to them. This should have been words to them that settled all their doubts, that gave them a, a foundation for that moment. But no, they, they don't even hear it. They totally missed what Jesus said. They haven't got past this idea that the life that they once knew is now vanished. They haven't got past the fact that they're all going to become deserters. Have you, like myself, have you ever forgotten God's promises in the midst of your life blowing up? I have. It's hard to believe Jesus' promise. It's hard to remember Jesus' promises like this one, I'll never leave you or forsake you, when you hear your spouse say, I don't love you anymore. It's hard to know that that, that God is going to take care of you when you're handed a pink slip. It, it, it's hard to stand beside a coffin and think about the resurrection to come. I mean, in those moments when our life is unsettled and changed and dramatically upended, we must remember that God's promises are certain and that that certainty is necessary when waves of uncertainty bury us. So here's the question that I hope you'll answer. Here's a question that I, I hope you'll answer yes to. But in the face of uncertainty of our nation and our economy and all that type of thing, is it possible that God is still active, still accomplishing His purposes when there is no indication of His activity? Is it possible that God is moving forward when the world is moving backward? Is it possible that that God is bringing light in the middle of a dark room, in the middle of a dark place? Is it possible that God is at work when you wake up to a new normal? Is it possible that God is going to work in your life when you have been a deserter? When you have been a backstabber? 
when you have failed God miserably, is it possible that God is still at work in your life? We've come to a time uh, where we are certainly cannot base our life on circumstances. And, and we're going to continue in an extraordinary experience of uncertainty in jobs and culture and government and the economy, in our retirement plans and our scholarships, in our ability to go to school or whatever. I mean, there's all types of things that are just up in the air right now. It's a time of epic uncertainty. And with all this uncertainty, I hope you can say yes to this question that God is still active when there is no indication of His activity in our lives or in our, in our, in our world's lives. And so, uh, in that upper room, imagine, imagine you were able to go back and talk to those disciples, uh, say a few months after the resurrection, all right? And you're able to interview them as a group. And, and you're, you said, hey, guys, when was the darkest moment for you when you were following Jesus? When did you have the least amount of hope? When did you begin to wonder, hey, did we follow the wrong guy? I bet they would say in that upper room during that Passover meal. And if you were to ask them another question that goes something like this, when did you find out there was such great hope uh, in Jesus? When, when did you figure out that Jesus was really God, that he, he knew what he was getting into and he knew what he was accomplishing? I bet they'd say in that same moment in that upper room. It, it, when life seems uncertain, God is certainly at work. And so the uncertainty that surrounds the crucifixion was crushed by the certain resurrection. I mean, this historic event is so important to bring stability to our shaky hearts, to bring uh, uh, courage in the midst of fear. And so if we were to ask these disciples, when was the moment that you knew that God was Jesus and Jesus was God and he was, he was in control of what was going on, they would say, well, certainly at the resurrection, we knew when we saw the resurrected Lord that, that God was with us. And so, I want you to embrace this next simple truth. I, I, I hope this is what you take home. I, I, well, you're already at home. I hope this is what you bury in your hearts, right? Times are uncertain, but Christ and His church are not. We follow a certain God. We follow a God who brings stability in the midst of chaos. And someone watching or listening to this message right now might have been trying to bring certainty to their life through bankrolling a lot of money or through their 401k. Uh, they might be trying to find certainty through their beauty or their popularity. Someone out there might have been trying to find certainty through their work or their family or their education. Some might be trying to find certainty through religiosity, right? So think of this. Think of the Christian who, uh, whose faith is based on the traditions that they normally are accustomed to. They go to church on these days. And when they go to church, they do these things. And, and because of these things, they know that God is in control. But now all that's been torn away, torn away for a season, and now we can no longer base our confidence on circumstances, but Christ alone. The only answer to uncertain times is Christ and His church. The most lasting name of all time is Jesus. The most lasting community of all time is His church. So I want you to surrender your uncertainties that you have about the future to a certain God. I want you to surrender uh, your uncertainties about God accepting you to His certain love. I want you to surrender your, uh, your, your shame uh, to a certain grace that's found in Jesus Christ. And I want you to surrender your life of sin to the certain righteousness of Jesus. These are times where where our world seems to be shaking. But I'm telling you, God still has the whole world in His hands.
Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the stories in this amazing book. I thank you for these epic tales of you stepping into people's lives, of you just taking the circumstances that are so distraught and bringing clarity to people. And most of the time, we cannot see it until we look back. And so, Father, right now, I know there's a lot of people, their eyes are on just what's right in front of them. But, Father, help us all to look up to you. Help us all to look into the Word of God. And, Father, help us all to look back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You still have us in your hands. It's in Jesus' name we pray. When everything else is falling around us, our God is still on the throne and he's still reigning. Let's sing this together. Higher than the mountains that I face And stronger than the power of the grave constant in the trial and the change one thing remains one thing remains sing your love your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never up it never runs out on me and your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love 
Thank you for joining us. You can find us on the web at cornerstonechatham.org.